Today I talked to Dr. Rebecca Robbins. Dr. Robbins conducts research at the NYU School of Medicine on the critical role sleep plays in our waking lives. She's also co-authored a book called Sleep for Success with Dr. James B. Moss. Dr. Robbins is published in many peer-reviewed publications, including Sleep, the Journal of Occupational Health Psychology, and Preventing Chronic Disease. Her work has also appeared in New York Times, The Financial Times, and Martha Stewart Living. So Dr. Robbins has appeared on many news shows, uh, so she's kind of like a, a sleep celebrity, if you will. And some of those shows have been Fox Business News, ABC World News Now, CBS This Morning, and ABC Nightline. She speaks on the topic of sleep to audiences ranging from uh, academic to corporate, including Google and General Electric, just to name a few. Before we dive in, I want to give a shout out for Dr. Robbins. She's looking for those people and organizations that are doing something related to the employee wellness function. It could be any size company, small, large, doesn't matter. And she's looking for a 10-minute phone interview. And it's part of a research study to advance the scientific understanding about the components of effective wellness programs. You can email her at rebecca.robbins at nyumc.org to schedule your interview slot. And that's also going to be linked up on my podcast page at redesigningwellness.com, so you don't have to memorize that email address. Today, Rebecca and I discuss the key benefits of sleep, you know, how we can make getting good sleep more normative and more kind of part of the conversation in a corporate environment. And then we also talk a little bit about her past at the Cornell Food and Brand Lab and around the 10% solution, just talking about management involvement in wellness. So I really enjoyed my conversation with Rebecca, and I know you will as well, so... Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, corporate wellness consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. So Dr. Robbins, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So you currently conduct research at the NYU School of Medicine on the critical role sleep plays in our waking lives. Tell me about your current sleep research and anything you're working on right now. Yeah, so our research is uncovering that most of the general population know a lot about good exercise and good nutrition habits, but sleep is really a third pillar of our our mental health, our physiological health, and our emotional health. And our research does um, just focus directly on how to educate and really help people and you know empower them with the reasons and the justifications and the motivations to make sleep a priority, and then just how to get really good, efficient sleep. Uh, my research in particular looks at the role of sleep actually in the workplace and how some work sites that are uh, being really cutting edge are looking at how, how to help their employees get healthier sleep. But by and large, the majority of wellness interventions are still focused on the exercise and the nu- nutrition piece. Do you feel like most people understand that they need to get more sleep and it's really just in the, they're getting distracted and just going to bed later and later? Or do you feel like they really don't even know how good it it is for them? Great question. Now, I think that a lot of us know generally what we're supposed to do when it comes to getting good sleep. We know that most adults are supposed to get seven to eight hours. Teenagers and kids need a little bit more. We know that a pre-bedtime routine is good. But when push comes to shove, we live crazy lives and it seems like technology almost allows us to do more than we've ever been able to do. And there's so much temptation to extend your bedtime, you know, stay up, watch Netflix, and things of that, of that, nothing against Netflix, but, you know, whatever your, you know, video purveyor of choice is, um, stay up and, and use those, you know, either unwind or stay up and do work into the wee hours of the night. And it's easy to think that sleep is just the absence of wakefulness. But what we try to do here at NYU is educate on the critical link between sleep and our waking success and help people people realize that sleep isn't just the opposite of wakefulness, but instead there's so much that happens in our brains, in our bodies during sleep, that it's actually a th- almost a third physiological state and absolutely a critical part of our waking success. So a lot of our work is really trying to make that type of view and perspective more salient. 
and then give people the motivation then to do the things that they generally know, but again, maybe forgotten or haven't remembered you know, or haven't done much of mm-hmm. since they were back at home under their parents' supervision, because that's when, if we look at our population, the people in our society and our population who are doing it sleep really well are our children. (laughs) These are the group that are practicing pre-bed routines. They are keeping a a consistent sleep-wake schedule. They're falling asleep at the same time. They're waking up around the same time. And so almost every adult is doing the opposite. We're sleeping in on the weekends. We're extending our bedtime in the wee hours of the, the night when a big deadline comes up. We're drinking caffeine. We're, you know, we're on our iPhone instead of our maybe reading a book before sleep. So a lot of us could, could take a page out of the, uh, the book of the children in our population if we want to sleep better. Yes, I actually have a three-year-old right now, so he is uh, really hard to get down for bed. And we were on vacation last week, and he was completely out of his routine to mm-hmm. where he would go to bed much later, but he would still get up at the same exact time. And that was you know, a, d- a disaster by the end of the night. It was, it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, here, you know, that's a great example where kids have a very, what we say, well-entrained circadian rhythm. And circadian rhythm, when it comes to sleep, refers to our individual pattern of uh, the awake and sleepiness so that ideally when we're all really well entrained, our circadian rhythms are really well in sync with our environment. Just like your son will be waking up without an alarm clock or falling asleep, you know, at the same time that will allow us to get the rest that our bodies need without having to wake up with an alarm clock. So that actually is something that we really work towards, uh, waking up at the same time and falling asleep at the same time in our research here at NYU. Yeah, I've got so many questions with this, but let's start with really why sleep is so important because I think people know it is, but I don't think they really know the really about all about the the brain and what happens when you're sleeping. So can you go through maybe some key benefits to sleep? Definitely. We have a lot of and growing evidence that sleep plays a role in our endocrine functions, our ability to maintain a healthy immune system, such that if you take individuals who are healthy and then getting six hours versus eight hours of sleep, the six hour sleepers are almost three times more at risk for colds, for flu, for viruses. So getting healthy sleep is one of the best ways to stay healthy, stay in the office and stay in the classroom and not have to spend, you know, time at home fighting an illness. Uh, Appetite. So we see that sleep regulates the hormones uh, and the the specific um, factors that actually contribute to our metabolism and our ability to understand when we are truly physiologically, you know, hungry or, you know, needing fuel and when we are just, um, you know, maybe eating for other reasons. So there are two molecules that are actually under the control of our sleep. And we see that these variables are thrown off when we're sleep deprived. There are two hormones, ghrelin and leptin. And when we're sleep deprived, our leptin levels are all out of whack. So we wake up thinking um, or with a much more handicapped way to tell when we're full and when we're still hungry. So weight, um, our ability to fend off colds. And then at the population level, when we look at this, the duration of sleep and relate that to various outcomes, and if we go to you know, right to mortality risk, individuals we see who are outside, adults outside the range of seven to eight hours, which we see is the recommended amount of sleep, Individuals who are outside that range have a much higher risk for chronic illness, cardiovascular disease, and even greater mortality risk. So we're unpacking really the physiologic, the processes that go on at night. Um, we've touched on a few weight management, you know, endocrine functions, but we're, we're really unpacking those mechanisms. But right now we do, we can conclusively say that we're not, you know, again, entirely sure how we might be able to consolidate the benefits of sleep into, you know, less time. We just know that we do need to spend those hours sleeping and also get efficient rest by doing things during the day, like get exercise and have, you know, eat a healthy, balanced diet, um, healthy relationships with others that all contribute to our ability to get that good sleep at night. So there's a lot of emerging research around sleep, and it seems like it's in the news every other day. And obviously, we're talking about it now. And you know, it's effect on health. So Mm -hmm. why do you think that it's we're talking about it so much now and not, you know, 10 years ago? Well, the the field of sleep medicine is actually relatively new. We discovered rapid eye movement sleep, you know, 
within the past 50 years. And so sleep medicine is actually a relatively new field if you compare it to other areas of medicine. So I think just because it is, you know, partly, you know, it's just a nascent field in many respects is part of the reason that there's still, you know, we're uncovering all these relationships and all of these phenomenon that relate to sleep and our, you know, physiological health and well-being. But um, it also is just an exciting time in sleep medicine, not only from a research perspective, but we are seeing a little bit more interest in the media. So um, folks like my friends, my friend Ariana Huffington has done a wonderful service to our field to uh, promote awareness about sleep in the media, getting research articles out there. And a lot of my other colleagues are working Dr. Mark Michael Gridner, Dr. James Moss are working with with athletes and doing some really important research around um, some athletic, you know, connections and performance elements that can only, you know, come after getting good sleep. So, I mean, who can, you know, who's not interested in that? So, right. lots of fun stories like that. Getting some excellent and well deserved press is really helping catapult the field into the you know, more of the public discourse and helping debunk this notion that sleep is a luxury and that, you know, you can sleep when you're dead, you, sleep when you're dead, you know, worse or, um, you know, sleep when you're retired. But we see that it's really your everyday contribution to getting that, you know, efficient, good quality sleep that ultimately has offers the, the, uh, the long-term benefits in terms of mortality and uh, long-term health and well-being. Ariana Huffington has really made it popular. I mean, she's all over the place talking about how important sleep is, which is, it's nice to hear from someone of that stature mm-hmm. and someone leading mm-hmm. an organization. Because in the entrepreneurial world, there's definitely a, you know, people talk about waking up at 4 a.m. and you get so much done before anyone else is up. And, you know, what do you say to those people that are getting up super early to get more done? Or maybe these are the same people, the people who say, oh, I only need five hours of sleep at night because I hear that all the time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If I could show you the, you know, or if we pulled you into the sleep lab, your uh, your sleep curve is really, it's very illustrative to see which, you know, how your body moves in and out of the different stages of sleep and especially rapid eye movement sleep. And we see that a lot of uh, for the majority of individuals, rapid eye movement sleep takes place predominantly in between the seventh and the eighth hour, the, the latter half of the night anyway. So rapid eye movement sleep we're seeing offers tremendous contribution in terms of improved uh, cognitive function, memory, learning. And so if we're cutting our sleep short at five hours, and I see that all the time, people will come up to me and say, you know, I'm not doing too bad. I think, you know, I get five hours. I'm not too bad. <laughs> and my, my response is always like, you're great, but you could even be better with just a little bit more sleep. So with those individuals, it's often trying to shift the motivation. And one really good exercise that I, I do, especially with a lot of kind of, you know, corporate types, and it seems like there's something about being in the C-suite that comes, you know, has this badge of honor of, mm-hmm. you know, oh, I only need five hours or, you know, so on and so forth. But um, often it's not the, the most gregarious or, you know, outgoing CEOs that are, you know, getting healthy sleep. But I can't tell you how many times I'll give a talk in a corporate environment and then the CEO will pull me aside and show me a sleeping bag under their uh, their desk what? and then their assistant's in on it. And so the <laughs> assistant will tell you that, uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so is on a conference call, but they're actually taking a nap. So That is amazing. Uh, so you'd be surprised. And I'm really intrigued in the corporate setting how to get sleep more is more normative because right now the, the norm and, you know, definitely I'd love to hear your experience or from that of your, your listeners, but often the what people talk about when it comes to sleep in the corporate setting is not getting enough. And this is kind of regular discourse too. You really hear people talk about getting healthy sleep or walking into the office without a cup of coffee saying, Oh, you know, I feel great. Got, you know, got my eight hours last night. And you feel it seems, you know, much more so that you would hear people, you know, maybe brag or maybe more kind of disclose that they haven't been able to get good sleep the night before. Just a little bit more normative in conversation, our research shows, to talk about the negative aspects than Mm -hmm. the positive. So a lot of our work is trying to reframe that. And there's no better place than in the corporate environment. And we say, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. If we can, you know, flip the coin so that instead we're talking and not bragging about getting good sleep or not getting good sleep, but instead having it part of the discussion. This is something I always share with families. Uh, 
to say to, you know, to parents, the biggest gift you can give your kids is to start a dialogue about sleep. You know, honey, if you're not feeling great in the afternoon, you know, how was your sleep last night? What worked, but didn't work? How can we make improvements? And similarly in the corporate setting, it would be so neat for there to be more dialogue around sleep, healthy sleep, how to get it, um, kind of de or making destigmatizing nap rooms and things like that. Because even in um, corporate environments that have nap rooms, they're often very stigmatized and rarely used, unfortunately. So uh, Brian and I published a paper not too long ago um, in the Journal of International um, Health Promotion, and then another paper recently in the Journal of Occupational Health Psychology. And we looked at the different components of wellness programs and the different activities that managers can do right away. And we saw that managers were the least likely to support a nap room. So we have a long way to go to make these these types of behaviors and things more normative in the corporate setting. So when you're talking about Brian, you're talking about Dr. Brian Wansink, right? From Cornell. Yes, okay. correct. One of my longtime mem- mentors and just an incredible researcher and, and person too. Great. Well, I definitely want to get into that a little bit later. And I was going to ask you about nap pods because those seem to be an emerging trend. And and in the companies that I work with, typically you don't see those. It's not, I mean, you can, you're barely, you know, you're fighting for a lactation room, much less a meditation room (laughs) or a nap pod. Um, So do you see employers embracing that? I hope so. You know, Asian cultures are actually very open to these in uh, the corporate environment. It's much more normative to either have, you know, a nap room or or take one or maybe run home to take a nap. And um, there is more in Europe. There's a longer kind of siesta period. But we do see in in the the Eastern culture, the Asian culture, this, you know, having power naps and shorter, you know, brief interludes of, of rest to be a little bit more normative. And if not rest, then definitely meditation or, you know, quieting your mind for, you know, 10, 15 minutes in the afternoon. But they're just, it's very stigmatized in the U.S. And I I feel like we have a lot of things to overcome. Individuals are a little bit nervous about the cleanliness, you know, sharing a bed with someone else or, you know, really the logistics of the nap room, I feel like are often, you know, what (laughs) we'll go to right away, which is always interesting to me. Well, actually, that was my first (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, that was my first thought when I was looking at the nap oh, pods. I was like, oh, somebody else is sleeping in there. And then I go in there and it, it does feel a little bit um, unsanitary, if you will. Definitely. So I feel like with, you know, you mentioned entrepreneurs, it's a healthy, it's a, a ripe area for innovation. So I would love to see some some cool approaches to overcome some of those issues with nap rooms. Uh, but, you know, definitely, I think they're more more and more common when, I, when I'm when i at HuffPost. I know that Ariana has installed those all over, which is fantastic. Um, Google has them. But there is also making that stuff not only available in the corporate environment, but one of the biggest factors to consider for employee wellness is making things normative, whether it's standing, you know, desks or walking meetings or nap rooms. I think it really starts at the top. And that's what some of the research I've done with Brian, with Dr. Wansank has uncovered is the need to engage managers, even just middle, you know, middle of the middle management, the people who have the most employee or, you know, lower level employee facing roles to get out there, start the dialogue about sleep, about exercise, about nutrition, uh, and how they can support their employees yeah, in those you, goals. And you published a study about employee wellness and the 10% solution. Is that what you're referring mm-hmm. to? Tell us, a yes. little, tell us a little bit about what you found in that, that research. Yes, this was, was an article that we published in the, the Journal of Occupational Health Psychology. And what that 10% solution refers to is that uh, based on the, the fact that so many of our wellness programs often start to point a finger at employees, you know, you should do this, you personally should do this or that. And it puts a lot of the, the onus and the responsibility on the, the shoulders of the individual employees. But we all know, uh, you know, we can all attest that behavior change is hard. And sometimes, you know, it takes a village. If you want to lose weight, I mean, you have to talk to your your spouse about it. And it has to be a family issue. And, you know, having support, social support from your friends, from your coworkers is one of the strongest predictors of whether that, that goal will be achieved. So the social piece to our health and well-being is so critical, but it's often under often under explored in the wellness space. So what we came up with was this ten percent solution. We said, who are the key individuals who might not be engaged in wellness right now? And we came up with this middle manager idea. 
that it's not, you know, yes, the C-suite, yes, the, the leaders of your organization are absolutely critical, but so too are the, the managers that have the con, the, you know, that face to face everyday contact with their employees. And these are the, you know, the masses in the, the big Fortune 500 companies, but even the smaller companies in the U.S. and abroad and elsewhere, other countries. And what we said was these, these managers might actually really want to be involved in wellness, especially in the present environment where we find ourselves, where health is becoming so, so, you know, such a topic of interest, healthy recipes, new diets, new exercises. So how about we leverage these individuals? And we came up with this idea. What if companies could get behind a policy where managers were not only evaluated for what they do in their job, how good they are at producing widgets or expense reports or, you know, selling computers or whatever it is, whatever the, the actual work of your company, but what if they also could be evaluated and motivated and um, and promoted by what they do to promote health and wellness in their environment in the corporate, you know, the, the social fabric of their organization. So we found it was unbelievable. Managers wanted to be involved so much so that they actually said that they would leave their current job if they could, they were offered an, a, a role at a completely, you know, a competitor with all the similar job description characteristics. The only exception being that that company would motivate and advance them as people, as managers, by what they did to promote health in their workplace. So what we said is, you know, it doesn't have to be a lot, but what if we could make 10% of performance evaluations and advancement criteria the things that these managers do to promote health and wellness? And I was previously a middle manager, and I can definitely mm -hmm. attest to the fact that I feel like middle managers set the culture more than the CEO um, because they, we're with them all the time. So although the CEO and the senior leadership sets a huge example and really leads by example, I, I definitely agree with the middle managers. I think where I struggle is that typically with management, even outside of health and wellness, you don't generally get appreciated, recognized, or promoted for being a good manager. So if, mm. if you take all the time and invest in your employees and you care about their health and wellness, I mean, I love that solution because I don't think, I don't think the manager who is a, a good manager, if you will, who really cares actively about their employees' health, it doesn't get recognized at all. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's very um, encouraging that you found those results that people wanted to help their employees with that. Mm -hmm. And of course, it will take that C-suite getting behind the policy of advancement and promotion based on those criteria. Because just like you said, right now it's kind of a, an add-on. So in addition to doing everything that you're currently doing as a manager, you, you know, if you're interested in health, you have to take it on, on your own. You're kind of on your own in that endeavor. So by getting everyone on board, the C-suite, and having it be corporate policy that managers are advanced in part by what they do in this regard, then you have, you have motivation. I mean, your, part of your salary is dictated by what you do. So it, it's really based on this whole idea, um, you know, classic kind of, you know, management by walking around theory or, you know, you, mo you, um, you reward what you want to see in your, your, your corporate environment. How do, you, how do you think that would work with the uh, managers who are not into health and wellness, that they have their own personal barriers or just not at that stage of change where they want to work on their own health and wellness? How do you see that going over with them? Really good question. Well, I will actually, um, another piece that we published in, um, in 2015 was a paper on what we called uh, workplace health codes of conduct. So not only uh, do you have a conduct code for, you know, not wearing Speedos in the office or, <laughs> oh, come on. you know, responding to emails or, you know, whatever your code is, what if you also had a code of conduct for health? So you you bought in to this culture where as a new employee, you signed your name on the dotted line to make your health a priority and, you know, not necessarily stigmatizing people or saying you have to lose X number of pounds or, you know, any strict uh, regulations of that sort, but instead just making it a priority and, and signing up and signing in to a culture and a, a place that would really help you, you know, reach those goals. So uh, in that study, we looked, we did some, some breakdown by different uh, demographic factors like your BMI and, and otherwise. And we did find some opposition in the obese category, BMI over a certain level that would classify you as obese. But what was so interesting was we found the highest motivation for these types of 
programs and the highest interest and most favorable ratings came from individuals who were who weren't healthy weight but were overweight so they were right in between the obese and the normal weight individuals and that to us told us that people who are overweight they want this support from from their companies from their um, from their managers so that was a really interesting statistic that the, the very you know high health risk individuals might give you some pushback but the individuals who are right on that cusp of change and who are really needing it and, and receptive to it really want these interventions and these initiatives right i think it's just all in how you go about it right if it's a supporting mm-hmm. caring thing versus you need to lose x amount or you know i think it's all about how you go about it um, not mm-hmm. everyone's ready to make that change but if it's just a general health and wellness and it's not specifically about weight but maybe it's about sleep maybe it's about mm-hmm. relationships or something that's a little bit bigger um and doesn't feel as personal maybe absolutely and that was our hope with the 10 percent article to address really the fabric the social fabric of the organization and that's where we found so many wellness programs go wrong it'll be very individual targeted you know we lose these you know x number of pounds you know employee x Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then you just feel like a number you're not you don't feel valued but whereas uh interventions and workplace initiatives that can make it part of you know make whatever you're trying whatever change you're trying to see in your corporate environment make it more of the, the social fabric, get people, you know, really motivated and behind the effort and get the, the conversation going, then it can be really powerful. So I'm going to stay on this topic just for a minute before we go back to sleep. So I got a few more questions about sleep. So we talked about Brian Wansink, who you worked with at Cornell when you were in the food and brand lab. You know, I am a big, uh, I guess, a wellness nerd, and I have uh-huh. that, that uh, website bookmarked because I think some of the research is so practical. What was it like working with uh, Brian Wansick, and, and what did you learn while you were there, maybe some key discoveries that you made within the lab? The Food and Brain Lab is an incredible place. Dr. Brian Wansink is a really visionary guy. He um, his, his main focus is on science that will really advance our health and wellness as a population in very very tangible ways. So the coolest thing about his research is it really starts with what what would the headline be or what would the tagline be if you're on the phone with you know Jennifer someone like you who's really on the ground working uh, you know in this area what is the the key takeaway or the message that will help people right away. And not necessarily what will get cited or, you know, published in the scientific literature, but what will really catalyze some, some powerful change to advance our health as a society, as a, as a global society. So that's where you really start when you're um, thinking about a study uh, at the Food and Brand Lab. So I had a, a, an amazing time and, and really enjoyed working with Dr. Brian Wansink. And Brian's research um, is so focused on is leveraging behavioral economics in the health space to make the healthier choices the easier ones. Because whenever we have to think extra, you know, walk an extra, or try to, you know, rack our brains for the healthiest place that's close by or, you know, go the extra mile for your health, that's when all of us fall off the wagon because we're all busy and, you know, have families and, and this and that. And so it's all about making it easy. Absolutely. So let's get back into sleep because I still have a few a few questions I have for you. Um, uh-huh. Do you feel like work or the corporate environment is contributing to the sleep deficit that we have today? You know, great, great question. It's so hard to conclusively say yes or no. And as a classic academic, I'm going to say it depends. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine. Uh, uh, certainly, I think the uh, always on culture of technology and cell phones and email make it uh, or one of the steepest challenges to our health and wellness and our sleep in particular. And uh, when I do go into the, the kind of the corporate environment and hear about bosses and CEOs sending middle of the night emails, um, little things like that really do go so far to set an expectation for employees that that's what they should be doing or, you know, that's what's natural or normal. So whenever we can uh, start to look at those in the, those affordances as, you know, not something that we always have to be receptive to, but instead, you know, of letting them rule our lives, you know, rule our lives and then look at those as resources. That can be a really powerful approach because then we can prioritize the things that will bring us energy and allow us to perform at our peak, which are, you know, in many times exercise and, and healthy sleep and healthy relationships with our spouses. But it's so easy. I think if anything, if I could, you know, peg one thing, I'd say it's that, you know, the ability to be always on and it's a temptation that's always there. 
So when it comes to sleep, one of the most powerful things is at night, turning your phone into airplane mode, because that's just one extra step that shuts you down for the night. Whereas if you have emails buzzing and things coming in, it's easy to, to as soon as you have a little bit of insomnia, which can be normal, mm-hmm. you know, tossing and turning to wake up and roll over and open that iPhone or that Blackberry and see what the most recent email is about. But instead of, you know, of that approach, really looking at your sleep as a critical part of your waking success and really structuring your day and your life around getting at least, you know, at least seven, ideally, uh, for most of us could really bring you and, you know, most of us, again, like that, that point that I get from so many people, you know, I'm not doing that bad as I am, or, you know, I, I think I'm doing pretty well. But what if you had a little bit more sleep? You might be really surprised on how much more you're able to accomplish. So a lot of our work is really attitude change mm-hmm. and then making those, those behaviors that I don't think are too hard. It's trying to resist sleeping in, which is one of the worst things we can do, but is unfortunately you know, such a luxury to so many of us because we do get shortened sleep during the work week. But if we could all do, you know, a couple small changes when it comes to sleep, turning our phones to airplane mode, and those of us in leadership positions trying to set an example of, um, you know, no middle of the night emails, avoiding the sleeping in on Saturdays and Sundays. And what that will do is allow your sleep to become more efficient by getting up as close to your normal time, your work week time as possible, your body starts to understand when it's supposed to be awake and when it's supposed to be tired. So it will know that if you're up and at them at 7 a.m. most you know weekday, weekday nights or weekday mornings and then follow suit on the weekends, your sleep schedule will just become like a really well-oiled machine and then you'll fall asleep faster at night because who wants to spend, you know, waste time tossing and turning at night. So a couple small changes can go a long way and really set you up for success. So I was recently facilitating a class and someone asked because they had a, I guess they worked split shifts. So they were doing, um, I think it was three twelves and it'd go from daytime to the nighttime the next week. It was just crazy, crazy, um, I don't know. I don't know how anyone does night shift. I'll ask you about that in a minute. But um, well, she rotating was, shift is the absolute worst. So my heart really goes out to that person. Well, let me go ahead and ask you that. What happens to your body when you have to either do a night shift? So some people work completely night shift. So I want to first question is night shift, and then the second question is when they do those split shifts, going from day shift one week to night shift the next. So our research here at NYU is it looks directly at health disparities, and that's a broad umbrella. Occupational health disparities are one other really, uh, really big issue in the health space. Now, if you work the shift, the reason that's so problematic for your sleep and then ultimately your health is because of light. So as I mentioned, um, the circadian rhythm for a really good sleeper, you're really well, what we say, entrained to your external environment and the strongest cue that will um, make your your pattern of sleep and wakefulness very well you know kind of organized and efficient is your exposure to light so where our, our our wakefulness is triggered by exposure to bright blue light in the morning from the sun so if you're a shift worker your day starts when it's dark out so you have a much harder time understanding your body does physiolo- you know, evolutionarily, physiologically, that it's supposed to be awake because it doesn't have that bright blue exposure that comes into your brain through the eyes to the brain region called the suprachiasmatic nucleus that kickstarts the awake phase of your circadian rhythm and then allows you to power through your day. So those individuals are right away at you know, a real loss when that, uh, from that kind of circadian rhythm kickstart phase. And then there, especially if you're on the graveyard shift, you're driving home and it's light out. So your body, essentially, if you're a graveyard shift worker is in constant flight mode. And there are very few people without severe health risks that work the graveyard shift for that reason. So it's a population that needs extra attention in terms of health promotion and wellness. And there are ways to overcome those working conditions. Uh, A couple of them include avoiding caffeine later in your shift uh, so your body can start to power down. Wearing um, these special blue light blocking sunglasses Hmm. on your way home in the morning. And you can look those up for shift workers. 
but what they do is they block the bright blue spectrum and uh, will allow you, if you go right, put those on from the hospital or wherever you are, the police station, wear your glasses and then go right home. The other key thing is to block your calendar. So allow for seven to eight hours of deep, uninterrupted time for sleep. And you go into a dark room, you have blackout curtains, no light can come in and you really emulate the nighttime. And it's so tempting. And unfortunately, the the biggest thing, it's such a barrier, is a lot of the individuals who are doing the shift, the graveyard shift, have to for financial reasons. And it's often a a second job for them. So whether it's a second job or they maybe have daycare or childcare responsibilities, it seems like it's perfect. If you're a single Mm -hmm. parent, for example, you can work at night and then take care of your your children during the day. The only thing is your health suffers and it's dramatic. So a lot of our work is trying to educate around those risks and then empower the people who are able to make the changes, uh, those those tools that can allow them to get the rest that their body needs or as best as they can. I think those are really good tips for um, night workers because I think they just, it's, it's a struggle, right? You get up and then everyone else is up. So you feel like you have to go do things and obviously you want to see your kids and it is really hard to get to just want to go to sleep. So those blue blocking um, sunglasses seem really interesting. I'll have to look those up and link them, link them up in the show notes for, so employers can find them. Oh, wonderful. Please do. Yeah. And I only worked one night shift in my life and it was back in college when I worked at Toys R Us. And, um, oh my goodness. Yes. And Toys I went, R Us is open 24 hours? No, we were doing something for the holidays, of course. So it was very oh. important for me to be there. And then I went to school oh, the next day. And uh, I do remember around two or three in the morning, I wanted to just curl up in one of the aisles and go to sleep. I and do how, nothing. <laughs> yes. I don't know how I made it through. I made it to class after that, but it, uh, <laughs> oh, it was rough. So how people do it all the time, I... My hearts go out to them because I, I know I couldn't do it at all. So Amen. could you, can you stock sleep? So if you, let's just say you get run into sleep deficit. I know you just said, no, you need to go to sleep. You need to wake up and go to bed at the same time on the weekend. Got it. But let's just say you wanted to sleep in one day just to kind of you know, power up, if you will. I'm assuming you're going to say, no, that's not a good idea. But in general, can you catch up on sleep? So Jen, there is a concept in sleep medicine called sleep debt. A medical resident, for example, who has two years where they do nothing but do overnights and <laughs> you know um, shifts and and really deprive themselves of sleep to to you know advance their career and learn more and all very value you know valiant things, but unfortunately, those individuals who are um, you know really depriving of the, themselves of sleep for, for the long term. And emergency room physicians would be another prime example or graveyard workers. Those individuals are creating a massive sleep debt whereby each night they deprive themselves of sleep and it's kind of like you're at your your bank account is in arrears. Almost you're um, you know charging things to a credit card that you're not paying and it does accumulate conversely we do have some research with Navy SEALs, actually, or uh, military personnel who have to go into long tours of duty. We do see that those individuals can stockpile a little bit of rest so, such that if they get uh, eight, nine hours of sleep in the nights leading up to those tours of duty, they're able to to power through those uh, those days and of sleep deprivation ahead. So in the short term, yes, but all of the benefits of sleep cognitively, physiologically come into play when you see sleep can, when, instances where sleep can, uh, can extend beyond or can, ex, you know, be healthy consistently is what I, sorry, is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think Navy SEALs, they're just, um, they're machines. <laughs> Can't even pretend true? to compare myself to them. So <laughs> when you, most days during the, the corporate work and, you know, corporate work day, you get a little sleepy spell around two or two thirty. Mm. So why does that happen? And what can we do about it? You are human. <laughs> <laughs> so almost everyone has a midday dip in alertness between uh, two and four in the afternoon, partly induced by lunch, the kind of food coma mm-hmm. that is actually very real. Uh, but also just partly due to the fact that you've been up for, um, you know, X number of hours, depending on, you know, your, your bedtime or your, excuse me, your wake up time. But your uh, there are two concepts that are at odds in all of us. The first is something we called, call sleep pressure. And that starts building as soon as you wake up. And it's kind of like, you know, this graph that just, it, it's a p- direct positive relationship to the amount of hours that you've been awake. This sleep pressure accumulates 
So sleep pressure is building and you've just been up simply for long enough where your body's, you know, kind of, you know, getting a little bit tired at that point and partly induced by food. But that is the, uh, the re- those reasons taken together are why power naps are so, so, so excellent in that time period to get some sleep, get down for a little while and uh, power through the rest of your day. So one of my mentors, Dr. James Moss, coined the term power nap when everyone oh, wow. in the 80s was talking about power breakfasts and power lunches. Mm-hmm. And he had this idea, you know, why not take a power nap and get rest instead of trying to just, you know, power through the day. Uh, so his his research and uh, subsequent evidence shows that the power nap is is best if it's about 20 minutes. And that's because of the rapid eye movement phase of sleep so that if you uh, can set an alarm and just get 20 minutes, that will get you rest leading up until the REM cycle that will, if you wake up in the middle, in the midst of your REM cycle, you can wake up and be very groggy. We've all been there. Those Mm -hmm. naps where you just, you're ready to go back to sleep and then you can't get out of bed and then it ruins your (laughs) night, your night's sleep. So avoiding that with a 20 minute duration can be a good solution for that midday dip in alertness. Yeah. I always say I have a 20 minute power nap or I have a three hour nap and there's usually not either (laughs) anywhere Mm -hmm. between, but I'm a big fan of the power nap and, um, yeah, it just feels like it just gets you right in that right spot and you wake up and you feel so much better. And Amen. yes, once maybe the nap pods will make more of a, you know, <laughs> they'll start getting into the corporate environment more, then maybe it'll be more acceptable. That would be nice to go take a 20 minute nap. Yes, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So sleep's a very individual behavior, you know, meaning like an employer can't force employees to get eight hours of sleep a night. And I know you mentioned a few tips, but is there anything an employer can do or maybe as people are assembling wellness programs, you know, what can, what can they do to promote good sleep habits among their employees? Uh, it's almost ironic that sleep is part of workplace wellness, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, because, you know, why are employers talking about sleep if they're, you know, sleep is something they do off the, the, the clock. So if we're talking about health and wellness, we have to talk about sleep simply because it's just such a critical central part of our waking success. So from that standpoint, if you think of health broadly, not as just, you know, maybe getting up or using a standing desk or, you know, going for a 15 minute run at some point during the day, but a broader, more holistic view, then you can start to understand why sleep does have such a, you know, a critical role in these programs. Um, so there's, there's that is part of my answer, but um, you know, kind of a different view of, of health and wellness. But the other uh, really tangible thing to do is is bring in, you know, sleep researchers, sleep experts to talk to employees about sleep, about uh, creating these cultures that talk, you know, encourage employees not to send middle of the night emails mm-hmm. <laughs> to, you know, socially norm sleep deprivation, because that is one place where sleep really comes into play. But also just to prime some of these cognitions. And when corporate folks have seminars on nutrition and exercise, why not incorporate a sleep one that's really based on the science uh, and someone who's really, you know, credible and able to deliver a solid presentation to employees or even do a longer term um, intervention. We do have some evidence from our lab that um, sleep tracking and uh, some of these wearables like the Fitbit Mm -hmm. and up by jawbone, all those devices are doing a lot to bring sleep into the dis- the kind of everyday discourse more and more. Yes, and I have to say, as a prior manager, I was not always the best at not sending emails. And I have to say, I, w- I was guilty. I always, I always told my team when we were together, you don't have to answer them. I don't expect you to. But sometimes that is the only time I can get work done. Uh, but now I'm feeling a little bit guilty that I ever did that to them. So. You know, for my team, if you're listening, my former team, if you're listening, I'm sorry, I sent you those emails at night, but I never expected a response. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, I, so, uh, we won't, we won't hold that against you, but it's kind of like, it reminds me of that, um, what, you know, the old school parenting approach, you know, do what I say, not what I do. Yes. <laughs> and so I had one uh, person I was interviewing for a study not too long ago and she was telling me how she was like, my team knows I have the worst sleep habit. She was like, I, I send emails at 2 a.m. in the morning, oh. you know, 2, 3 a.m. And she was like, oh, but they know that it's just me. So I'm not worried about it. But leaders really, I mean, people look up to us, you know, you, you, folks like you uh, or, you know, leaders in the in the corporate setting. And they're behaving 
the behavior really has a, a tangible impact. And so sometimes it's hard to separate someone's circumstances and why they might be doing something, you know, and justify it. We're very good at doing that for our own behavior, saying, oh, you know, but, you know, I was up, you know, breastfeeding or mm -hmm. you know, the dog woke me up or, you know, this or that. It's hard for other people to, to understand your circumstances mm -hmm. that, you know, as a C-suite executive, what's going on in your life that caused you maybe to get up and send that email. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of the, you know, delayed release. If you do um, get up in the middle of the night, if you can use, I think it's Gmail that has this great feature and you can schedule when that email can go out or maybe draft the email and then, um, you know, allow it to send when you have service in the morning. Things like that can uh, be really good little tricks too. Yes, there's definitely lots of options around sending, you know, not sending them at night or, and getting your thoughts out. And I knew that they were all available to me, but um, didn't always take them up on it. And I think it really is one of the realities of being a middle manager, though, because if you're in meetings, all it, this is to me, I, and I'm hearing myself make excuses, I, but I do think it's a reality of you're in meetings all day. The only time you have to catch up sometimes is at night. Um, but I do mm -hmm. think that the, the delay email is, is the good solution. Definitely. And, you know, look at the, I'm, I'm with you at the end of the day. It's, it's so hard. And especially women in the workforce, you might have two jobs, one at home and, and one in, um, in the office. And so it's, it's incredibly hard to do these things, but small changes go a long way and there's nothing wrong with, you know, giving it a shot, trying things out, seeing what works for your, you know, your personal habits and, um, your, your personal sleep will benefit from it as well. If you're staying off those devices, the other is the other thing to remember. So one of the other, the last kind of parting, um, comments I'll make is I can underscore, especially, um, and I don't get the, the sense from you at all, Jennifer, the, um, but for type A personalities, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding <laughs> a, a severe sense of that from you <laughs> <laughs> oh wow I came across that bad huh? <laughs> just you know high achieving individuals like yourself and all of your listeners, one of the best things to do before bed is to have a what we call a worry time. Keep an, a stack of note cards or a, a notebook by your bedside table and put things down, anything that comes to mind before you fall asleep, whether it's sending that team email, whether it's um, you know having a conversation with your spouse, sending a text message, however silly, it's the best exercise. And your brain will start to develop the ability to do this on its own, this kind of clearance and, and really shutting down before bed once you practice the strategy but if you you know ritually every time before every night before bed have this kind of brain dump of whatever's bugging you or on your mind you'll fall asleep much faster that is such a good tip sleep is one of those things that if i don't get it i'm not a nice person and so yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think everyone should get their seven, eight hours of sleep. <laughs> I'm with you. Our mood is the first to go. Yes. We start snapping at people. It's so true. I think it's mood. And then going back to what you said earlier about appetite, like all I want is fatty carbs and it's not, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not good for me. So um, I also want to point out that you have a book called Sleep for Success, Everything You Must Know About Sleep But Are Too Tired to Ask. Oh, uh, thank so you. I'll definitely put that in the show notes because you've given us so many tips here and I'm sure they can find more in that book. But uh, where where can people find out more about you and some of the research you're doing? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so the book, Sleep for Success, we um, hope it will put you right to sleep. <laughs> Actually, it's your for insomnia in that way. <laughs> um, but the best way to follow us is, um, and our current research is Brian's work at Cornell can be found at the Food and Brand Lab uh, website. And then I'm just Rebecca-Robbins.com. But you can also find me by looking up our research here at the Center for Healthful Behavior Change at the NYU School of Medicine. And I will link all of those up in the show notes. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It was a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for all the great bits of wisdom and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. If you want to get your wellness program started in a positive direction, visit redesigningwellness.com. I have free resources, blog posts, as well as more information on my consulting services. Thanks for listening.